Hello, my dear students. Welcome to Teacher at Home. Today, class, we are going to learn the third chapter, Ruling the Countryside. The company becomes the Diwan. On 12th August 1765, the Mughal Emperor appointed the East India Company as the Diwan of Bengal. The actual event most probably took place in Robert Clive's ten with a few Englishmen and Indians as witnesses. But in the painting above, the event is shown as a majestic occasion taking place in a grand city. The painter was commissioned by Sea Live to record the memorable events in Sea Live's life. The grant of Diwani clearly was one such event in British imagination. As Diwan, the company became the chief financial administrator of the territory under its control. Now it had to think of administrating the land and organizing its revenue resources. Uh, this had to be done in a way that could yield enough revenue to meet the growing expenses of the company. A trading company had also to ensure that it could buy the products it needed and sell what, I wa what it wanted. Over the years, the company also learned that it had to move with some caution. Being an allied power, it needed to pacify those who in the past had ruled the countryside and enjoyed the authority and prestige. Those who had held local power had to be controlled, but they could not be entirely eliminated. How was this to be done? In this chapter, we will see how the company closed to colonize the countryside, organized revenue resources, redefined the rights of people, and produced the crops it wanted. Revenue for the company. The company had become the divan, but it still saw itself primarily as a trader. It wanted a large revenue income, but was unwilling to set up any regular cash system of assessment and collection. The effort was to increase the revenue as much as it could and buy fine cotton and silk cloth as cheaply as possible. Within five years, the value of goods bought by the company in Bengal doubled. Before 1765, the company had purchased goods in India by importing gold and silver from Britain. Now the revenue collected in Bengal could finance the pur purchase of goods for export. Soon it was clear that the Bengal economy was facing a deep crisis. Artisans were deserting villages since they were being forced to sell their goods to the company at low prices. Peasants were unable to pay the dues that were being demanded from them. Artisanal production was in decline and agricultural cultivation showed signs of collapse. Then in 1770, a terrible famine killed 10 million people in Bengal. About one third of the population was wiped out. Peasants and artisans from rural areas regularly came to these weekly markets, their goods and buy what they needed. These markets were be badly affected during times of economic crisis. The need to improve agriculture. If the economy was in ruins, could the company be certain of its revenue income. Most company officials began to feel that investment in land had to be encouraged and agriculture had to be improved. How was this to be done? After two decades of debate on the question, the company finally introduced the permanent settlement in 1793. By the terms of the settlement, Rajas and Talukdas were recognized as Semindas. They were asked to collect rent from the peasants and pay revenue to the company. Amount to be paid was fixed permanently, that is, it was to be increased ever in future. It was felt that this would ensure a regular flow of revenue into the company's offers and at the same time encourage the zamindars to invest in improving the land. Since the revenue demand of the state would not be increased, the zamindar would, would benefit the, from increased production from the land. Problem. The permanent settlement, however, created problems. Company officials soon discovered that the zamindars were, in fact, not investigating in the improvement of land. The revenue that had been fixed was so high that the zamindars found it difficult to pay. Anyone who failed to pay the revenue lost his zamindari. Numerous zamindaris were sold off at OSHAs organized by the company. By the first decade of the 19th century, the situation changed. The prices in the market rose and cultivation slowly expanded. This meant an increase in the income of the zamindars but no gain for the company since it could not increase the revenue demand that had been fixed permanently. Even then the zamindars did not have an interest in improving the land. Some had lost their lands in the earlier years of the settlement. Others now saw the possibility of earning without the trouble and risk of investment. As long as the zamindars could give out the land to tenants, and get rent, they were not interested in improving the land. Colibrock on Bengal rights. In many villages of Bengal, some of the powerful rights did not cultivate, but instead gave out their lands to others, talking from them very high rents. 1806, H.H. Colbock described the conditions of these under tenants in Bengal. Under tenants depressed by the excessive rent in kind and by 
unsure his returns for the cattle seed and subsistence advanced to them can never ex excavate themselves from debt in so object a state that cannot labor in spirit while they earn a scanty uh, subsistence without hope of bettering their situation on the other hand in the villager the cultivators found the system extremely oppressive the rent he paid to the zamindar was high and his right on the land was insecure to pay the rent he had to often take a loan from the money lender and what he failed to pay the rent was evicted from the land he had cultivated for generations a new system is devised by the early 19th century many of the company officials were convinced that the system of revenue had to be changed again how many revenues be fixed permanently at a time when the company needed more money to meet its expenses of administration and trade in the northwestern provinces of the bengal presidency an englishman called halt i can see devise the new system which came into effect in 1822 he felt that the village was an important social institution in north indian society and needed to be preserved under his direction collectors went from villages to villages inspecting the land measuring the fields and rec recording the customs and rights of different groups the estimated revenue of each plot within a village was added up to calculate the revenue that each village had to pay this demand was to be revised periodically not permanently fixed the charge of collecting the revenue and paying it into a company was given to the village headman rather than the zamindar this system came to be known as the mahalwari settlement the mundro system in the british territories in the south there was a similar move away from the idea of permanent settlement the new system that was devised came to be known as the right war it was tried on the small scale by captain alexander or read in some of the areas that were taken over by the company after the wars with tipu sultan subsequently developed by thomas munro this system was gradually extended all over south india read and munro felt that in the south there were no traditional zamindars the settlement they were argued had to be made directly with the cultivators who had tilled the land for generations they feel have to be carefully and separately surveyed before the revenue assessment was made Munro thought that the British should act as a paternal father figures protecting the rights under their charge. All well was not well. Within a few years after the new system was imposed, it was clear that all was not well with them. Driven by the desire to increase the income from land, revenue officials fixed a too high a revenue demand. Peasants were unable to pay. Riots flooded the countryside and villages became deserted in many regions. Optimistic officials had imagined that the new system would transform the peasants into rich enterprising farmers but this did not happen crops for europe the british also realized that the countryside could not yield revenue it could also grow the crops that europe required by the late 18th century the company was trying its best to expand the cultivation of opium and indigo in the century and a half that followed the british persuaded or forced cultivators in various parts of India to produce other crops due to in Bengal tea in Assam sugar cane in the united provinces wheat in Punjab cotton in Maharashtra and Punjab rice in Madras how was this done the british used a variety of methods to expand the cultivation of crops that they needed let us take a closer look at the story of one such crop one such method of production this color have a story history figure 5 and 6 are two images of cotton prints image on the left shows a Kalamkari print created by weavers of Andhra Pradesh in India. On the right is a floral cotton print designed and produced by William Morris, a famous poet and artist of 19th century Britain. This is one thing common in the two prints. Both use a rich blue color commonly called indigo. Do you know how the color was produced? The blue that you see in this print was produced from a plant called indigo. It is likely that the blue dye used in the Morris prints In 19th century Britain was manufactured from indigo plants cultivated in India. For India was the biggest supplier of indigo in the world at that time. Why the demand for Indian indigo? The indigo plant grows primarily in the tropics. By the 19th century by the 13th century Indian indigo was being used by cloth manufacturers in Italy, France and Britain to dye cloth. However, only small amounts of indigo Indian indigo reached the European market and its price was very high. European cloth manufacturers therefore had to depend on another plant called wool to make violet and blue dyes. Being a plant in the temperate zones, wool was more easily available in Europe. It was grown in northern Italy, southern France and in parts of Germany and Britain. Worried by the competition from indigo, wool 
producers in Europe pressurized their governments to ban the import of indigo. Cloth dyers, however, preferred indigo acid dye. Indigo produced a rich blue color, whereas the dye from both was pale and dull. By the 17th century, European cloth producers persuaded a government to relax the ban on indigo import. The French began cultivating indigo in Saint Dominique in the Caribbean islands, the Portuguese in Brazil, the English in Jamaica, and the Spanish in Venezuela. Indigo plantations also came up in many parts of the North America. By the end of the 18th century, the demand for indigo, Indian indigo, grew further. Britain began to industrialize and its cotton production expanded dramatically, creating an enormous new demand for cloth dyes. While the demand for indigo increased its existing supplies from the West Indies, American collapsed for a variety of reasons. Between 1783 and 1789, the production of indigo in the world fell by half. Cloth dyers in Britain now desperately looked for new sources for indigo supply. From where could this indigo be procured? Britain turns to India. Faced with the rising demand for indigo in Europe, the company in India looked for ways to expand the area under indigo cultivation. From the last decades of the 18th century, indigo cultivation in Bengal expanded rapidly and Bengal indigo came to dominate the world market. 1788, only about 30% of the indigo imported into Britain was from India. By 1810, the pro proportion had gone to 95%. As the indigo trade grew, commercial agents and officials of the company began investing in indigo production. Over the years, many company officials left their jobs to look after the indigo business. Attracted by the prospect of high profits, numerous Scotsmen and Englishmen came to India and became planters. Those who had no money to produce indigo could get loan from the company and the banks that were coming up at that time. How was indigo cultivated? There were two mini systems of indigo cultivation and ninja and variety. Within the system of ninja cultivation, the planter produced indigo in lands that he directly controlled. He either brought the land or rented it from other zamindas and produced indigo by directly employing hired laborers. The problem with the ninja cultivation. The planters found it difficult to expand the area under cultivation. Indigo could be cultivated only on fertile lands and these were already densely populated. Only small plots scattered over the landscape could be acquired. Planters needed large areas in compact blocks to cultivate indigo in plantations. Where they could they get such landform? They attempted to lease in the land around the indigo factory and evict the peasants from the area. But this always led to conflicts and tension. Nor was labor easy to mobilize. A large plantation required a vast number of hands to operate, and labor was needed precisely at a time when peasants were usually busy with their rice cultivation. Ninja cultivation on a large scale also required many pluffs and bullocks. One bigger for indigo cultivation required two pluffs. This means that a planter with 1,000 bigas would need 2,000 pluffs. Investing on purchase and maintenance of ploughs was a big problem. Nor could supplies be easily got from the peasants since the ploughs and bullocks were busy on their rice field, again exactly at the time that the indigo planters needed them. Till the la late 19th century, planters were therefore reluctant to expand the area under niche cultivation. Less than 25% of the land producing indigo was under this system. The rest was under an alternative mode of cultivation, the variety system. Indigo on the land of rights. Under the right system, the planters force the rights to sign a contract and agreement. At times, they pressurized the village headman to sign the contract on behalf of the rights. Those who signed the contract got cash advances from the planters at low rates of interest to produce indigo. But the loan committed the right for cultivating indigo on at least 25% of area under his holding. The planter provided the seed and the drill while the cultivators prepared the soil, sowed the seed and looked after the crop. Workers harvesting indigo in early 19th century, Bengal from Kolisworthy Grand Rural Life in Bengal, 1860. In India, the indigo plant was cut mostly by men. How was indigo produced? In indigo villages were usually around indigo factories owned by the planters. After harvest, the indigo plant was taken to the wards in, uh, in the indigo factory. Three or four wards were needed to manufacture the dye. Each ward had a separate function. The leaves stripped off. The indigo plant were first soaked in warm water in a vat. Several hours. When the plants fermented, the liquid began to boil and bubble. 
Now the rotten leaves were taken put, taken out and the liquid drained into another vat that was placed just below the first vat. In the second vat, the solution was continuously stirred and beaten with paddles. When the liquid gradually turned green and then blue, lime water was added to the vat. Gradually, the indigo separated out in flakes, a muddy sediment settled at the bottom of the vat and a clear liquid rose to the surface. The liquid was drained off and the sediment, the indigo pulp transferred to another vat and then pressed and dried to sail. Here you can see the last stage of the production workers stamping and cutting the indigo pulp that had been pressed and molded. In the background, you can see a worker carrying away the blocks for drying. When the crop was delivered to the planter, after the harvest, a new loan was given to the right, and the cycle started all over again. Peasants who were initially tempted by the loans soon realized how harsh the system was. The price they got for the indigo they produced was very low and the cycle of loans never ended. There were other problems too. The planters usually insisted that indigo must be cultivated on the best soils in which peasants prefer to cultivate rice indigo. Moreover, had deep roots and it exhausts the soil rapidly. After indigo harvest, the land could not be sown with rice. The Blue Rebellion and after. In March 1859, thousands of rice in Bengal refused to grow indigo. As the rebellion spread, rice refused to pay rent to the planters, attacked indigo factories armed with swords and spears, bows and arrows. Women turned up to fight with pots, pans and kitchen implements. Those who worked for the planters were socially boycotted and the gomastas Agents of planters who came to collect rent were beaten up. Right so they could be no longer take advances to sow indigo, nor be bullied by the planters. Let the Alzalati welding strong man maintained by the planters. Why did the indigo peasants decide that they would no longer remain silent? What gave them power to rebel? Clearly, the indigo system was intensely oppressive. But those who are oppressed do not always rise up in rebellion. They do so only at times. 1859, the indigo riots felt that they had the support of the local zamindars and village hetman in their rebellion against the planters in many villages. Hetman who had been forced to sign indigo contracts mobilized the indigo peasants and fought pitched battles with the lethials. In other places, even the zamindars were around villages using the riots to resist the planters. These zamindas uh, were unhappy with the increasing power of the planters and angry at being forced by the planters to give them land on long leases. Indigo peasants also imagined that the British government would support them in the struggle against the planters. After the revolt of 1857, the British government was particularly worried about the possibility of another popular rebellion when the news spread of a simmering revolt in the indigo district. A song from an indigo producing village. In the moments of the struggle, people often sing songs to inspire each other and to build a sense of collective unity. Such songs give us a glimpse of their feelings. During the Indigo Rebellion, many such songs could be heard in the villages of Lower Bengal. Here is one such song. The long lathis, wielded by the planter of Mulahati, now lie in a cluster, the bases of Kolkata had sailed down to see the great fight. This time, the right are all ready, they will no longer be beaten in silence. They will no longer give up their life without fighting the Lithials. The Lieutenant Governor toured the region in the winter of 1859. The right saw the tour of a sign of government sympathy for their plight. When Barasa, the magistrate Ashley Edin, issued a notice stating that rights would not be compelled to accept indigo contracts, word went around that Queen Victoria had declared that indigo need not be sworn. Eden was trying to placate the peasants and control an explosive situation, but his actions were read as support for the rebellion. Support for the rebellion. As the rebellion spread, the intellectuals from Calcutta rushed to the indigo districts. They wrote to the misery of the riots, the tyranny of the planters, and the horrors of the indigo system. Worried by the rebellion, the government brought in the military to protect the planters from assault and set up the Indigo Commission to inquire into the system of indigo production. Commission held the planters guilty and criticized them for the corrosive method they used with indigo cultivators. It declared that indigo production was not profitable for rights. The commission asked the right to fulfill their existing contract but also told them that they would refuse to produce indigo in future. I would rather beg them so indigo. 
Hadi Mullah, an indigo cultivator of Chandpur, Tana Hadi, thus interviewed the members of the Indigo Commission on Tuesday, 5th June 1860. This is what he said in answer to some of the questions. Vetsan Kar, the President of Indigo Commission, are you now willing to sow indigo? And if not, on what fresh terms would you be willing to do it? Haji Mullah, I am not willing to sow and I did not know that any fresh terms would satisfy me. Mr. Sale, would you not be willing to sow at a rupee a bundle? Haji Mullah, no, I would not. Rather than sow indigo, I will go to another country. I would rather beg than sow indigo. After the revolt, indigo production collapsed in Bengal, but the planters now shifted the operation to Bihar. With the discovery of synthetic dyes in the late 19th century, their business was severely affected, but yet they managed to expand production. When Mahatma Gandhi returned from South Africa, a person from Bihar persuaded him to visit Champaran and see the plight of the indigo cultivators there. Mahatma Gandhi's visit in 1970 marked the beginning of the Champaran movement against the indigo planters. So that's all about this chapter. If you are interested, please do like, share and subscribe my channel. Okay, thank you.